National Democrats, smelling the scent of a Georgia victory in the air, are pouring an additional million dollars into campaign ads in the state's race for U.S. Senate. Attacks on the outsourcing record of Republican candidate David Perdue and polling showing Democrat Michelle Nunn in the lead with close to the 50 percent needed to avoid a runoff prompted the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee to launch $800,000 in ads on Wednesday in Atlanta, and an additional 200000 is soon to come. Meanwhile, Georgia's gubernatorial race is giving Deep South Democrats even more reason for hope. State Senator Jason Carter, the Democratic candidate, who also happens to be the grandson of President Jimmy Carter, is running neck and neck with Republican incumbent Governor Nathan Deal, according to polling from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. But those Democratic hopes in those two very tight races where increased turnout among voters of color could make all the difference could be dimmed by the outcome of a dispute over African-American voter registrations. Last week, a lawsuit filed in Georgia alleged that more than 50,000 African-American voters newly registered by the group called New Georgia Project are missing from state records, which would jeopardize their ability to vote on Election Day. But Thursday, Georgia's Secretary of State fired back at those claims, saying his office has confirmed nearly 40,000 of those voters are on the rolls, with an additional 10,000 on a pending list of voters who still need to confirm their identity. So, Cornell, it does seem that there's some Democratic hope in Georgia. The Democrats started to send some money. But it is going to rest on primarily voters of color, especially African-American voters. And cover of the New York Times today is the black vote seen as the last hope, right, for this Senate race. And you have in this article about the black vote being seen as the last hope for Democrats to hold the Senate, you've got Cornell Belcher, who is a pollster, writing African-American surge voters came out in 08 and 12, but they're not positioned to do so in 14. In fact, over half aren't even sure when the midterm elections are taking place. So for all the money they're pouring in, are they pouring it in the right place here? Uh, clearly, we need to focus on turning out the African-American vote. What's critically important to remember here is in Georgia, we have an organization with the NAACP that's registered 10 percent, at least 10 percent of those voters who are unregistered in places where um, th those votes are often neglected and discounted in rural communities, uh, older voters, African-American voters, uh, black and brown voters. And so the point being here is where 60 percent of unregistered voters could tip and turn the election. Uh, it's important for us to reach out. The NAACP has been doing that on the ground. Uh, I think that's a positive note. But overall, uh, it is very sobering, mm -hmm. very sobering that those votes are being uh, forgotten, particularly at a moment where this is the first election in the generation where the American elect electorate mm -hmm. is unprotected by the Voting Rights Act. Right. Okay, so th so this point I, I think is such a key one, and Nick, it, it, it runs to the point that midterm elections are so different than presidential yeah. elections. Even that language by Belcher that, that it's possible that a large proportion of, of a group of voters don't even know when the election is occurring because there's just right. much lower information. It, just in a, like backing up for a second and just looking at health of democracy as opposed to sort of, you know, Georgia. Uh, if we're in a circumstance where you have such surge and decline and midterms are really a different kind of population who are who are showing up to vote, is it still is it still an accurate reading, temperature taking of what a group of people actually want for their representation? You know, if you don't vote, you, you know, if, if, if I'm not sure you can argue yeah. that it's not fair. Mm -hmm. You know, people have to vote. It's up to them to vote. They have to come out and vote. If you don't vote, you, you are not part of the conversation. You know, have a say in, in who's going to be in there. Um, uh, it's everybody's duty to get out and do it. Uh, so I'm not, you know, I'm not one of those people who's going to say that, well, you know, if, if half the country isn't voting, it's their fault if they aren't voting. Okay, so this is, an <laughs> this is an interesting idea, right? So I hear you saying it's the first time in a generation you're not protected by the VRA. I hear you on the other hand saying, look, we're Americans, we're kind of rugged individualists. Uh, you know, it's, we're, not, we're not in a place where you are required to vote, so you got to kind of get out there and do it. How do we, you know, if we look at a place like Georgia where you have this changing demographic reality that may or may not turn into a changing electoral reality? I was going to say, I agree with both, but, but we, <laughs> well, we, all know, we all know the data and we all know for example, young voters, for example, in the Latino population, the voters are so predominantly young. Um, we, we know that young voters, we know a lot of voters just don't, low-income voters, don't traditionally vote as much as um, older, more affluent voters. So I think that the parties have missed an opportunity. A lot of Latino voter groups are saying that the, the, the parties have really missed an opportunity before the midterms to inject uh, more funding, mm -hmm. uh, direct contact. There's a lot of studies that show just that phone call, just that direct phone call mm -hmm. makes such a difference with voters. And so I think it's 
it's in the middle. Yes, we mm -hmm. all should be voting, but we also know that it helps to get someone to the polls first. And once again, Georgia, you know, what's interesting in Georgia as well is that the the, the, the state Democratic Party has been kind of moribund mm -hmm. for years and years there yep. under Republican domination. Um, it's largely outside groups that saw the surge in the Hispanic population and looked at the proportion of voting age African Americans mm -hmm. who were not registered which is enormous. And said there's an Georgia. opportunity said, here. We, if we can just register these people, and the state party isn't doing it. Mm -hmm. It's well, so, outside. Right. So, right. 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 To be fair, I think the demographics at this point still favor Republicans. And when it comes to the Latino... In terms vote, of the voting demographics. Oh, absolutely. Georgia, were like, oh, right. absolutely. Right. In terms of Georgia, the Hispanic yes. community has like grown incredibly. Yes. But yep. in terms of the Hispanic electorate, right. it's still very small. very small. To make a difference, the vast majority would have to come out to vote, and that's not going to happen. Okay, so, so, so let, me, but let, me, let me go on that, because part of it is also demographics need not necessarily be partisan. I mean, even exactly. as we just saw in that story about Daddy King, and then we say, and so they got 70% of the vote. If Republicans could get 30% of the black right. vote right now, right. that would be game over for Democrats right. around the country, right? So it's interesting. So on the one hand, you have Rand Paul saying, I think we could go back to 1960. And I don't mean that, but I mean that we could end up with 10, 15, 20% of the black vote. On the other hand, I do, I just want to play this one little bit of, of, campaign commercial. It is a local campaign commercial, but it is coming from the national GOP, from the National Republican <clears throat> Party, because it, it strikes me as a party that might be confused about whether or not it wants minority voters. Let's take a listen. Nico Jenkins was released from prison early after serving only half his sentence. The head of the Omaha Police Union said Jenkins is the poster child for why the good time law is a farce. Brad Ashford supported the good time law and still defends it, allowing criminals like Nico Jenkins to be released early. So this is a, a Nebraska campaign, but it comes from the national GOP, and it just is Willie Horton. I mean, it just is. But, but to say that it's somehow racist just because they're uh, making I, reference to... I didn't say it was racist. I said it was racist. Right, but, that, but yes. that is the allegation. I think it's a fair attack considering that under this law, uh, there have been cases of convicted felons being released, and then when they're out, committing serious uh, crimes. So or, look, I think it's, it's a valid point. Yeah, yeah, Cordell, I'm going to let you weigh in, and then... A Willie Horton 2.0 ad, in addition to the Voting Rights Act being gutted, in addition to a, a, a Machiavellian set of strategies to disenfranchise American voters, it is not unreasonable for American voters, black and brown voters, to conclude you don't want us to participate in, in the, the democratic process. That's and, a fact. All right, and stick, stick with us. Uh, as, as you can see by looking at the screen, we've dubbed our segment this morning Midterm Madness. Now, in part, that's because of the multiple contests going on all at once in highly competitive fashion, just like NCAA's March Madness. But what I'm going to show you next, the new ad starring famed or infamous, depending on your take, Nevada rancher Cliven Bundy, is just one of pain. Oh, madness.